that is buried under this meat. But you see, by the exponential property, right, I can say that this is equivalent to showing that y join z is less than or equal to the exponential x to meet z to the x. Because we characterize the exponential, and I mentioned this in my email, we said that, well, uh, y to the x meet x is less than or equal to y. Bob? And if z Bob. If meet x is less than or equal to Bob. y, then z uh, is <laughs> weaker than x. So the x, y to the x is less than or equal to y. Okay. So the where z is less than or equal to uh, is less than or equal to y to the x. So that's what we define in exponential c. And a very simple lemma is you can do what is called the Hansen characterization of this universal property. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Bob, oh, can you okay. change pen and write bigger? Uh, not yet. I mean, it's, it's just as dark everywhere. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but okay, change. So let me let, let me continue. So let me. <laughs> You can, you can use simply the equivalence, which is that x meets z less than or equal to y, if and only if z is less than or equal to y. Okay. Okay, that's the sort of concept. That's a very, there's two different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, so you can do this. When, when uh, Ed talks about, uh, I think he'll talk about injunctions, or Ed talks about this probably at some point, these are the two different ways of, of stating the so that's just a simple, simple sort of side remark. So that's why it's equivalent. So that x meet y join z is equivalent to uh, being less than or equal to something is equivalent to y join z being less than or equal to that something to the x. So this is where I said what I'm doing in my email. I hesitated and I said, well, I can have one other hint I can think of, but it is probably only helpful post hoc. So what I'm doing is I'm getting the x out of the way. Okay, this may or may not be a helpful thing to remark, but I'm getting the x out of the way. Why? Because now I've exposed the join, okay? And a join is less than or equal to something if its two parts are less than or equal to that something, okay? So it suffices to show two things. Y is less than or equal to, let me just write ditto mark rather than rewrite that thing. And I have to show two things, that and z. This being the ditto mark. So the point being that if that's the case, this is the least of the uh, the least of the upper bound. Did I do this right? Or not? So but it's the least upper. Yes. Okay. So I uh, show y is less than or equal to this, and, and therefore they're joined. It's less than or equal to this. Yes. Okay. So uh, okay. Good. So now what do I need to do? Well, now I just go backward and I say, well, that suffices to show uh, this equivalence. I can bring the x back down that x meet y is less than or equal to, well, the part without them, so the exponential. x meet y joins x meet z. I don't need to do friends anymore. Okay, well, that's obvious, because anything is less than one of the, 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 the left, if you're joining two things, each one is less than. And I have to show for the other one that x meet z is less than or equal to this thing. And of course, it's one of the things that I'm joining, and so I'm done. Like a magic trick. Okay? So you'll, I'll, I'll show you something that will give you a little more intuition, okay, about this. All right, but that's one. All right, one, one way of doing this. So I get the x out of the way. I use the universal property to join, and then bring the x back in the way, so to speak. And then it ends up being one of the things I'm joining in each case, but so I'm done. So that's the, that's the for, for that. You can do the du dual version stuff. This is all illustrative of what you do overall. Okay, another hint that I gave you was to several people in person. I said, well, you could use the unit alone. And in, for this particular direction, you need the co unit alone, which I mentioned, which is uh, it, it's, it's the same thing. It's just the other way around, which says that x is less than equal to y if and only if everything bigger than y is bigger than x. Okay, right? Because if something bigger than y by transitivity is bigger than x. And if you take z to be y, then I get y is bigger than x. 
this is what's going on here. It's just the O'Neill limit and the dual free work with but I could I could say it like it's so another version is I say uh, it suffices to show I say suppose uh, U is bigger than or equal to that thing, which another way of saying it is that, that uh, where are we? Uh, this one. Okay. So I suppose that X meet Y join X meet Z uh, is less than or equal to U. Okay. And then what I want to show is that X meet Y join Z is less than or equal to U. Okay. Right. Because anything bigger than this or bigger than that tells me that this is bigger than that. Okay. Anything bigger than Y is bigger than X tells me that Y is bigger than X. Okay. Now it's funny. Okay. That very trivial remark. Okay. <laughs> It's like almost dumb. You just have to think of it. <laughs> okay, so now if you, 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 if you think this way, then you, can, then you have some moves available to you. Okay, so what do I have here? So this is what we're trying to show. Okay, so it's sufficient to show. Now I can use the exponential property. I have to use the exponential somewhere. Okay, we already established that. Okay, so I can use the exponential property here. So it's sufficient to show that y is going to be is less than or equal to uh, u to the x. Well, because in fact it's equivalent to show, uh, to showing this is equivalent to showing that by the other little lemma here, wherever it went, wherever it is, okay? So we have to show that the join, okay, the least upper bound is less than u to the x. Yes, you agree? That's the equivalent thing that I have to show, okay? So if I want to show this, if I want to show that the least upper bound of something is less than or equal to thing, this, this is, uh, 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 I, want, I want to show this. So what I know is, um, let me check here that I feel like I'm, uh, maybe I'll check my way. Uh, oh, I see, so I did this in a slightly different, uh, slightly different way. Okay, ah, so uh, let me do this in a slightly different order. Okay. First, let's look at this, okay. So we know that the least upper bound is less than or equal to u, okay. So this is what we're assuming, okay. So because this, the sum, the join things are each less than the join, so we know from that assumption that x meet y. So I'll do it in this direction. What I was doing is fine, but I have it in my notes differently. So we know that this is the case, and we know that this is the case because their join is less than u, so each of the things you're joining is less than u. But now I can use the exponential property, because this tells me that y is less than or equal to u to the x, and y is less than or equal, oh, sorry, uh, uh, yes, y, and then here it should say z, is less than or equal to u to the x, because I have that, that wedge there, that pan, okay. And uh, so I have those two things, and now we will use the remark that I said before. So the equivalent thing is that uh, equivalently, we have y join z less than or equal to u to the x. That's the equivalent thing to show. But if y is less than u to the x and z is less than u to the x, then of course they're joined. y join z is less than or equal to u to the x. All of them here. And that's what I needed when I'm talking. So once again, I use the exponential uh, property. Yeah. This, this one uses the Yonetal law. Okay, it's just using the fact that I, I'm starting out with the assumption that u is above this. And being above this means it's above the two parts. The two parts are meets. The meets are the same thing. So that gives me that y is below u to the x and u to the x. And z is below u to the x. Therefore, they're joined below u to the x. But their joined being below u to the x is the same as their meet with x is below u. Can you done that without the coding element by simply replacing that suppose less than or equal to with an equal? Like, well, that be the definition you do? Okay, that's right. Answer. If we start by saying let u equal x meet y join the x meet z. I didn't say equals. But no, I, so I if, if, if we were to, then, yeah. then like go through the same steps, then we arrive at the desired result without the coding element. Then you wouldn't need the lemma you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so maybe there's another proof. Yeah, there are, I mean, that's, okay, there are, there are lots of yeah. things. Okay, there are lots of things. But I, what I wanted to illustrate here was the pattern of reasoning that 
introducing this other variable, which in this case is above or below, depending on your point of view, uh, something and then showing that it's above or below, respectively, of the other side, then uh, that can be handled. Okay, because it puts you in a situation. You see, when I postulate that u is bigger than this mean, then I'm immediately can rewrite that as the thing that's being met with is uh, below the exponential. I can move them and get them out of the way, move them back and forth. Okay, so that's how that goes. All right, so those are the two proofs I, I, I first had in mind. But now that uh, there's another possible proof, which I'm not going to carry out for you, but it ties in with Frank's lectures and helps make my point about the Trinitarianism in a small way, because there's another thing you can do. I'm not sure if any of you thought of this, uh, but it's perfectly reasonable strategy. It is. You can use the completeness theorem. Use the completeness theorem, which I quoted for you, which was proved using uh, the construction of Lindenbaum algebra, which, as you'll see, is going to be the, the free theory. Okay, uh, I will tell you about that. Use the completeness theorem. Okay, for intuition of the proposition, which you now have under your belt, I think. Okay, from the lecture. So what you can do is you can just rewrite this whole thing as, it's a psychological thing, but it's just telling you that, uh, that uh, uh, what was the thing you wanted to prove? If I want to say that, think of this as, uh, I could use different letters if you want. A or B and C entails true, if you want to, if you'd like to use the, that. This true entails, uh, a, uh, oh sorry, that's true, but I did and or right now, okay. Uh, or A and B, or A and C. And then you can look at it as a logic problem to show that that's true. Okay. And you can use the connectives, okay, and reasoning about reasoning about the connectives to, to do this proof. And I think Frank might even assign this to you for more. So why the completeness theorem? Because when I'm trying to when I'm saying that every high chain algebra is distributive. I'm saying if you look at the class of all Heiting algebras, a certain uh, pre-order ordering relation is true, holds in, the, in every Heiting algebra. But the completeness theorem says uh, that the pre-order is to be interpreted as entailment. Okay? And if something holds in every Heiting algebra, then it must be provable. If it's provable, it holds in every Heiting algebra. So you can just transfer it over and think of it as a logic problem. And then when we add in proof terms, you can think of it as a functional programming problem. Because what you can do is you can say, I'll use this chart. I can say, well, if I have a variable that contains a product of a sum, of uh, A with a sum, then you can find me, write me a piece of code, which will be involved X, which will be a sum of product. So if you like to think that way, you can do it that way too. So this is this is a coding problem. So let's write some functional program. Okay, that's here because functional programs or proofs, or you can think of it as a program or a term if you like, of that type. And I'm not going to write that up for you here, but for uh, yep. shouldn't that last uh, A or C be an A and C? Yeah. What's up? The last A or C should be an A and C there. Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, that's the thing. The typical sort of thing that I screw up. Um, yep, that it becomes a product. So, like, as a sort of psychological matter, that's the only way I know how to say it, it might seem more natural to you to write a piece of, uh, you know, I know code or something to do this. Okay. Uh, fine, whatever you like. <laughs> okay. That's the beauty of it all. Okay. And it's part of how we know we have a decent programming language because I can do this. Okay. So all, all these ideas put together. And there are various fancy ways to deduce a similar thing uh, using category theory. So I, I don't think that is developed enough, so uh, I'll just write use categories. But there's the ways to do this. Because, well, I don't think Ed has yet developed uh, what are products and what are, what are sums. Have you? No. no. Yeah. Tomorrow. So that will come up. So it's, again, almost a psychological thing. Okay is you could just view the thing in terms of a category theoretic standpoint for some people. That's the natural way to think about it. And that's kind of what I did here, because I'm using 
you know, nailed on uh, the universal properties of the exponential. So I'm really doing it with categories, except that you can jazz this up and talk about the evidence, okay, that's involved, okay, and that's what the real Yoneda lemma is. The real Yoneda lemma is this, well, it, 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 it's, it's this thing, but taking account of the evidence. So you'll notice that this thing is, where are we here, is a universal property, okay, let me even break it out, so for every z, it's a universally quantified method like that. So it sort of says, it's kind of polymorphic, okay? That's the sort of way of saying it, that the relationship is there's a kind of polymorphism going on because the objects in the pre-order could be thought of as types, okay, or propositions, all right? And so we're saying something about all types, okay? That's what's happening here. So it's like polymorphism, and in category theory, that's called naturality. So when you get the actual proof of the Yoneda lemma, it says that there's a natural bijection between certain things. Because, why? Sort of because it's trying to account for the evidence. Say, not only is it true that if this is inhabited, that's inhabited, but moreover, there's a relationship about between the evidence that I can give here, a bijection between the evidence. So, uh, so that's another, another way of saying it. So that in the pre-order, what you're saying is, I have a map whose boundary is you know, y and z, as I was calling it. And here I'm only worried about the existence of a map. With a pre-order, I just mod out and say, I don't care what the maps are, the morphisms are, just say, there exists one. Well, that's a relatively weak thing. One can say something sharper by tracking how the other is transformed. And what this is then saying is, polymorphic functions like this turn into morphisms like that. Okay, morphisms whose boundary is left and right boundary are x and y are in one-to-one -one correspondence with natural transformation of the of like that. That's the actual unit of okay. So what happens is a certain kind of relationship is a way of, well, the words are a little suggestive, maybe overly suggestive, but I could say a fact like this manufactures a morphism for me. Well, it doesn't do that. It actually says one must do this. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. So the reason a lot of times in categories people pull out the innate lemma, it's because they need to show there exists a certain morphism, and the easiest way to do it in certain situations is to exhibit uh, a natural transformation between what are called com functors or representable functors, which uh, we'll probably talk about. Okay, so um, you'll get there. So, but the reason I foreshadow is because what I hope to have happen this week is for you to have a really serious understanding of how all the parts fit together. Okay, that there are these different points of view, but they, they really and genuinely are, uh, you know, very useful ways of thinking that are not so obvious from from another point of view. So we get gain mileage by shifting around in our in our, uh, in our thinking. So you might contemplate from a functional programming point of view, what would it mean to exhibit this morphism by exhibiting a natural transformation? Okay because you can do that instead. So you can say this programming problem can be solved by solving a different programming problem. So when you talk about, it, which is, involves coming up with a polymorphic functional, okay? And so when you get there, you should think about it that way. Okay? So what I would like you to encourage you to like, get used to doing is whenever some topic comes up, ask yourself, well, what does it mean in terms of programming? What does it mean in terms of logic? You know, what does it mean in terms of categories? Very, very, very useful. Okay, so in fact, some of the stuff I'm going to do today, I'm pretty sure Ed is not going to um, cover. I don't think Ed, I looked at his notes, I don't think you're talking about algebra for a functor, are you? No, I'm not. So uh, that's, uh, oh well, that's just the way it is. There's only someone in so much time in the lecture. So I, will, I, I have to decide then whether I'm going to skip some of my plan with or not. So. Okay, so now uh, what I would like to do is I want to pick up uh, where, well, where, where all three of us are to some degree uh, from uh, last time and earlier today, and I want to carry that forward in a certain direction. Okay, so uh, what am I going to do? So here's what I'm going to now take, take as given. So let me have a, a particular uh, summary of a bunch of things that I'll take as given from the accumulation of the lectures we've had so far. And if I'm off by a little bit, I hope you can fill in 
the missing part, but uh, you can also ask questions. So, so we'll do them. So here's what I'll take as, as, as given now. So what we're given is what is called a intuitionistic propositional logic, okay? Which can be viewed as, uh, probably that hasn't gotten that far yet, but it can be viewed as uh, the free by Cartesian closed category, so we'll, we'll get to see what, what that is going to be. Uh, and, uh, and, and it can also be viewed as a functional programming language like this, for example. So let's look at it from the point of view of Cypher. Okay, so this could be called, it's unfortunately an overused word. I could call this, uh, you know, simple type theory. Okay, and <coughs> don't, don't hold me to the terminology because people use different words for different reasons and different meanings, and that's a little confusing. Okay, so what I mean by this is we have set up, I'll just do it, I'll do it uh, very briefly. So, I don't know what, I never know what notation to use. We'll say one is a type. Okay, so that's the coordination. Uh, we'll say that's a multiple. It might be that my <coughs> isn't the same as everyone else's, but I hope we can slide back and forth. Okay, so this could be called uh, one formation or truth formation, and this could be uh, the uh, uh, one introduction, and there's no one elimination. Okay, why? Because Nothing went to there's a uh, Frank must have used some terminology similar to this. Uh, the, the principle of it here is the elimination cancels the introduction. That's the kind of thing you're thinking about. And the point is, is that I, I like to call it the principle of conservation of proof. Okay? If you don't put anything into something, you certainly can't expect to get anything back out. Okay? So that's the idea. Okay. You're, uh, you're, it's like energy. You're just moving stuff around and repackaging it in various ways that are more or less locally useful, but globally you're basically doing nothing. Okay. So that's sort of the uh, idea. Okay. So that's why there's no elimination because there's nothing to get back out. <laughs> and then you've already had uh, that uh, like a cross. I'll call it a cross B as a type. Okay. As, uh, Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I deliberately left room here. I'll come back to the space I have here. All right, so that's a simple thing. So that would be cross formation, right? And if M is in A, and M is in B, and uh, the pair is in A cross B, that could be thought of as and, okay, so you know, we're notating and thinking about these things. And then there were two elimination rules. See, two different things went into it, so I can get those two things back out. That's the principle. So it says, if you give me something in A cross B, well, the burden of proof, eventually you'll get a proof of something called cut elimination, which will make everything I'm saying you know, establish that it's true. But the principle of it is that, well, what must the only thing, what must have gone into M is two other you know, terms that one of A and one of B, so I can get them back out. If I put them in, I can get them back out. So first of all, I'll just double up these rules here for the sake of blackboard convenience, and that will be the cause of that. So we've done that, okay. Uh, you've done uh, the implication, so what we have A implies B, I'll write A arrow B is a type, if assuming A is a type, uh, well, no, I don't mean that at this point. I just said that A is a type and B is a type. Uh, and then, so that's the arrow formation, so some of this would be familiar. And then the introduction is a lambda, so it's an A or B. I will call that arrow introduction, if assuming X is an A and a B, with various variable binding conventions, which I'm not going to detail here, because that would take the whole lecture in itself. Uh, and I'll rely on common sense. And I say, well, what goes into being a function is a family of elements of B indexed by the elements of A. Okay? So if you give me an index element like that, then uh, I can usual notation to apply it. I can get B. That's the arrow I'll leave you space. Okay, so uh, this is sort of partly why sometimes this is written B to the A. Okay, it's sort of B exponentiated by A. It's A many copies of B. Okay, yes? Uh, would you mind switching markers? It's almost impossible to read up there. 
It's on the right James Parker. James Parker, okay. So the reason it's sometimes written B to the A is I have A many copies of B, right? And if you give me a particular A, then out of the A many copies, I will pick the nth one, okay? And I will get a B out of it, okay? So that's the, why the exponential notation is used. Okay, so then the other things are, uh, you have that, uh, that uh, zero is a type. So that's zero formation, and we have uh, no introduction. So there's no uh, zero introduction. But the idea is that this is the empty type. And the elimination says if you were to have something in the empty type, then uh, there's different notational conventions, but one is called a board of M, and that's a type A, and that is a zero limb. And that is expressing the idea uh, that that is expressing the idea of the, of the contradiction that this is type is also can also be called void. Okay, and this type can also be called unit. So they're fairly typical terminology. I think my suggestion made it worse. <laughs> it right well, I'm, I'm using the pens I have. Okay. No, there are some other there. What am, I, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you want me to use these? No, there is another one there. This one, that's the one I just put down. I can use Try the blue, the blue one. one. Okay. I, I think it's, it's a, more of a limitation of the whiteboard. Than, you know, but okay, that's the way. Okay. So, uh, I was expressing, I was just about to mention the idea that these are common terminology, except that unfortunately in the seated and pants programming world, uh, this is called stupidly, I'm sorry, it's called boy. Okay, yeah, that's completely wrong. Okay, that, that's good. the whole business like in C of boy star, that's a utter nonsense. Okay, not void. Void is empty, it has no value. So if you say a function returns void, what you mean is it doesn't return at all. Because if it were to return, it would have to return something. Okay, and there is no, there is nothing. So it's just a, a stupid thing. But it's very, it's very common in, uh, in the commercial world. Okay, so it's to call a unit void. So I want to, so here we'll just call that. Okay, now I need more space than I have. So I'll go over here. Uh, and so the last thing, well, I have some more to fill in, but the last thing is, uh, uh, is the, the disjunction of the sums. Okay, so we have if A is a type, if B is a type, then A plus B is a type. So that's a plus formation. Okay. And then you've seen if M is in A, then well, there, again there are different notational conventions. And in left of M is A plus B, that's the one I happen to use. Uh, and if M is in B, let's say, then in right of M is A plus B. Okay. So those are the plus introduction rules, there are two of them. And the elimination rule is a little, takes me a minute to write out. Because I have two introduction rules, so I have to account for the fact that there are two introduction rules, which means there are two ways to get back out what I got, what I put in. Okay, and so here's how that's expressed. Uh, the inversion of that. And it's expressed in a way that is a little bit uh, uh, looks complicated. So if I have this, okay, I have something which is an A or B. I want to express the idea that it's either in left or it's in right. So the way I'm going to express that idea is that to form a map out of A plus B, and this is a very important intuition, to form a map out of A plus B, a morphism out of A plus B, it's enough to form a map out of A, let's call it N, which is C. You take a map out of A, you take, oops, and you take a uh, map out of, out of B, well, let's call it P, which at this moment have the same type. I'll get back to that issue momentarily. Okay. If you give me these two bits of data, then I will, that's enough for me to form, or an even nicer way to run to write this is the following, because it emphasizes the mapping property. If you give me, oh, I don't call it X, how about if I call it Z? Okay, it's A plus B. Then case, 
of x dot n and y dot p is c. So to form a map from a plus b to c, it's enough to give me a map from a to c and a map from b to c. That's a way of saying that a plus b can mean only uh, a copy of a and a copy of b, and nothing else. Okay. So nothing else is implicit in the fact that I have a mapping from A plus B to C given only this data. If there were something else like bottom or some other silly thing, then this would not be a valid rule. It should be a case of Z, right? What's that again? It should be a case of Z. Did I make a mistake? Uh -oh. what, what should be what? It should be a case of Z. It should be Z. Case. Case of Z. Case of C. Well, yeah, if you want to be, I'm being loose about that kind of thing. Okay, if you mean, should I parameterize the case by the result type? No, case, case oh, of oh, C. Oh, maybe that isn't what I meant. You need the product, right? I need, so you need, you need the sum. The term. The actual term, like case of C. You know what the term is. I need C to be a prop, is that the C. Term? C. C. Right there. Okay, <laughs> what about C? Oh, C. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I, it, it can be very hard to see yeah. while, while you're standing there. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah, because this is just a concrete syntax for writing that. I have a map from A plus B to C called that, and if I want to, I can give a name to the argument and then supply it. it uh, that's, that's why I wasn't unable to see it momentarily. Okay, so uh, so that's just a. If you want named variables, which is what I'm using, then you should do what I wrote here. Okay, so uh, good. So those were the uh, those are the rules. So that's what we've had so far. Okay, good. So that's the what I call intuitionistic propositional logic. Okay, or simple type theory. Okay, for today's Now the other thing that you discussed is when are two proofs or terms equal? And now this is where I need. This is where things start to get complicated and interesting. Okay. So uh, first of all, it's an it, an intellectual question, okay, is what is proof equality? That's an interesting question. One should think about that. But I'll mention that before I write down a few things, what I'll mention is that uh, what equations I write down has no influence over what terms are well typed. Okay, but that will shortly not be the case. Okay, but right now I just want to mention this. So if, what I'm doing right now, I'm going to write down some equations. And in a sense, they're like nice things that you might enjoy. They don't have any force within the theory. But they are going to have some force within the theory, and then things become quite complicated. So that's a little foreshadowing. So you've already studied these things. And there's different terminology that one can have. Uh, but I will just use like uh, beta principles and eta principles. And eta principles are going to be thought of as uniqueness conditions. So this one I did with you last time, but let's just mention. So here you already know, so if I take, it's the Jensen's inversion principle, which is that the LM should cancel the interim. Okay, so that should be, I'll write triple bar. Okay, I'm not sure what everyone else has done. Okay, but I'll, I'll write triple bar. And in the end, I'm going to have to have a discussion with you about syntax, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so this will be kind of the, so those two things will turn out to be equal. So that's the inversion principle. Okay, that says 11 cancels intro. That tends not to be very problematic or controversial in any way. The uniqueness principles, I'll, I'll state, and I, I went through the derivation last time, so let me just write the short version, which says if I take, and now I'm omitting what exactly are the typing premises and all that, so I'm, I'm, I'm abbreviating in the interest of time and expecting you to be able to fill in things that I'm not right. So anything, uh, everything in the in the product type is of the form of a pair whose first component is the first component of M, and whose second component is the second component of M. So these rules, if I take first of them, I'll get first of M. So first of that pair is first of M. So I'm identifying and saying, well, M can only be that pair. It can only be a pair, but not just any pair, it's that pair. Okay? That's what we're doing. Okay, good. So now over here, there can't be any beta rule because there is no intro to cancel with an limb. But there is a uniqueness principle, okay? And the uniqueness principle is exactly the same one. It just says 
if I form the null tuple, okay, from the uh, elim forms applied to the there is no elim form, but the unit, I might have said no elim form, the elim. So there, the, I, I, it's the tuple consisting of all of the elim forms applied to the intro form, there are none. And so I said that that's equal to m and one. So everything in one is the null tuple. Okay, so again, over here, you've seen them. Uh, this is the well-known thing that was originally called Gia, uh, which is that, which says you plug in, and that's in B. If you give me an A-index family of elements of B, and I give you a particular A, then I plug into that family and say, give me the nth uh, element of that family, and that will be the meaning of that uh, application or instantiation. And Ida can be written in several forms, but the most concise one, and the one you probably have seen, is this one. And it's derived by an argument similar to the way I derived the one equation out of it. Really, it's derived from the universal property of the arrow, um, but uh, I won't go through that derivation right now. So it says everything in the arrow B it has the form of a lambda. And it's just the, uh, an indirect jump. It just says, you know, if you call this, I call that. You know, it's just one level of indirection. It's a proxy. Okay, that's what I'm doing. So I'm defining a proxy. That's what a proxy is, after all. Okay? So I define a proxy for M. You call it, it calls M. Okay? So that's the idea. Okay, uh, so over here, what do we do? Well, there's, uh, let's see, there's, uh, is there a beta rule? No, because I would have to have the elim, which exists now, canceling the intro, but there is no intro. I might have pronounced it that way with unit by accident. But there I can't do it because there's no elim to match to the intro. Here there's no intro to match to the elim, so there's no beta. Okay. But the question is what should be the uniqueness principle? What should we say for the uniqueness principle? Well, what would be the analog? Uh, in order to derive this, it's probably easier if I do this one first and get this as the nullary case of that in the same way that I got this as the nullary case of that. Okay, so let's jump over here and do it. So this is a little long-winded to write out, but if you're doing a case analysis and you have the left, so let's call it P, then what is that? It plugs in P for X and F. And that will be in C in this particular simple setup. And there's a similar thing the same, the exact same guy, but with in right of Q, let us call it, and that will be Q for Y and N. Okay? So that's easy, right? You have something which is a mapping, it's a mapping out property, case is a mapping out from the sum. If you give me an in left, then I do one thing, if you give me an in right, I do the other, those are the only two cases that are up. Now the question is, what should be the beta rule? Okay? What do we what do we what what do we want to say about the uniqueness principle? So there's two things, so this has to be derived. Okay, and this has to be derived. <coughs> okay. So what is it that we want to say? Okay, well let's remember what the co-product diagram looked like. That's the thing that's going to help us the most actually. Okay? Are you with me? Okay, so we have A injects into A plus B. And we have the E injects into A plus B. And we have the property that if M injects into C from B, and N injects into C from B, so that's what I'm doing here. This is the map of A to C. Okay? If you want, I could write this X dot M and X dot N to emphasize that X is ranging over B and giving me N and C and x is ranging over a and the m and c, so that's the notation for a morphism. In that case, I would write this as x dot in left of x, but often I'll just write that as in left, and here I would write it as in x dot in right of, uh, of x or y, not in right of y, okay, but either way. Then this rule says I have a mapping out property. The mapping out property says I can do a case with x dot m and x, oops, Okay, uh, let me just write the case. It's the one I've written down here. Okay, so I'll just write the case. All right, 
So I mean, be sure to read. That's the one I wrote here already. Okay, and it says that this is unique. Okay, amongst such things. So, uh, so what is the uniqueness uh, telling us? It says, well, if you gave me some other thing that goes from A plus B to C, and it has the property, so here's how you do it. So what you do is you say, well, if you give me some other thing, let's call it R, okay? And R has the property that on in left of M, oh, sorry, I called it P, let's do that. On in left of P, if that turns out to be P for X, M, and if R on, this, what does this R on this mean? Well, okay, if you want to be really correct, what I mean is I take in left of P and plug it into Z and R, some R, because I'm thinking of Z, you say, being the A plus B, okay? And then the in right of Q for Z it goes into R, and if that turns out to be uh, PQO by QR, oh boy, I shouldn't have called that. No, no, that's great. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm sorry. I'm not talking to you. So if R is pretending to be case, then it is case. Okay? So what this says is under these two premises, horizontal line, then I will know that uniformly in Z, that R, which has a Z in it, is equal to the case x dot n, x dot n applied to it in the appropriate place. See, see, okay. okay? So, why? Because remember what I showed you. If I have an R here, then this cell there exists, okay? So R is a mapping from Z and A plus B down to C, okay? So that's what we're doing here. If, when I plug in in left into R, I get the same as I get uh, the thing that I'm in left of, because if I take an M coming in here, okay, oh, I don't call it M, excuse me, I call that P, you're to think of T as coming in here, and you're to think of Q as coming in here, that's those arguments. Then P with in left via R is the same as P with X plugged in for X in M, that's what I wrote here, and if Q coming in plugged in, uh, followed by in, in right, followed by R, in right of Q uh, with R, instantiating R, it gives me the same thing as case, uh, as what the, uh, as what the, sorry, what X dot N does, if this lobe commutes. So what I've done here, the terminology is called whiskering. Okay, and you'll look at that in those notes, okay? So I take this lobe and I'm whiskering by P, and this lobe and whiskering by Q, just to illustrate how that works. So if R acts like case in all of the ways that it's supposed to act, then it must be case. So that's what this is saying. So same thing will happen over here, except it'll be nullary. And what I'll end up with is if you give me z and zero, then what do I know is that r is equal to a board of z. Okay. In other words, if r has this type, if if uh, yeah, this type, that's the r has a z in it, right? So if uh, this is going to be type C, or I call it A here, how would I call it C to be locationally consistent with that? So this would be C. So assuming that R is a map from 0 to C, a board is a map from 0 to C, okay? So uh, I'm saying, under the assumption of a falsehood, any such R is just the same as a board. And that's just the nullary text. So the idea is that a board of them, a board, is just case with nothing in it. Bracket. In fact, sometimes that case is written with square brackets so that we get the analogy between the empty angle brackets and the empty square bracket. Okay, that's sometimes people write it like that. Okay? And then in which case over here I would write x dot m, x dot n using square bracket notation. Okay? So if you empty out the square brackets, they'll be saying that the case analysis on nothing is the same as any old R but not so let's see, but not so zero. Okay, so those are the uh, those are the, the beta like and the eta like rules. Okay? Now I'm going to show you that this methodology breaks down immediately. Okay. So my purpose of going through this is to show you that it doesn't really work. Okay, yes. Yeah. What are the cookies for this table? Does what are the saying if you have any voicing and 
the assumption on that on the eta rule there? The assumption is that if z is in zero, r is in c. Um, so give me any map out of zero. So even if it doesn't use z, it's z. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, in this setting, it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, if r is any map from zero to c, then it's in some sense uh, witnessing a contradiction, a like canonical contradiction of the board. Um, okay, so. It yeah. It doesn't matter. It's in the presence of it. Okay. So that's the point. Okay, so that's that's how that works. But it's, I found that the reason I did it in that order is this is the nullary case of that. And so one way to get this result is not to think about it, just say it's got to be the nullary case. Right. And then if that works, it's fine. It's going to work. Okay, that's the idea. Ah, yes. Before we move into the system completely, uh, I, it looks like the beta rules here are like the soundness proofs that we've been seeing in the other class. Yes. And the eta rules are like the completeness proofs. Yeah, except that I'm going to show you, yes, that in terms of aligning terminology, yes, exactly. Okay. But now I'm going to show you that the whole thing is kind of a mess and it doesn't really work. Okay? But I'll get to that. So uh, there's a method to my madness, but the only way I know how to explain everything is to let it emerge. I can't say everything simultaneously. It's always a problem. So you have to hold certain things in the band. So I, I, I uh, wrote a triple bar there because I wanted to use some neutral looking thing that expresses something that looks like an equation. Um, that's what I wanted to do. Okay, so now what I want to do is uh, move on from, from uh, that basic set. Okay, and so the basic setting, okay, in order to motivate, let me see what I want to do here. Uh, I'll skip that. Uh, let me think here what I want to do. Okay, so good. Now I want to enrich my pet theory. Okay? All right, so this is the sort of the basic uh, of, of simple, simple type theory corresponding to the proofs of intuitionist and propositional logic. Now, the next thing that comes up, and I'm going to use some evocative terminology in, in order to bring out a certain point. So what I want to do is now augment this with what I might call data types. I'll put it in quotes. Because there's lots of types in the world, okay, and they're not all looking like proposition. Okay? So it doesn't mean anything. There's no like I cannot look at a type and tell you that's data, that's not, that's absurd. Okay? But uh, you'll see what I mean in a minute. So the thing that I want to do is to start with, first thing I want to do is look at the natural numbers. And then we will see that these principles that I'm, I'm illustrating here break down. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to get to. All right, so this is the type of natural number. So how do we define it? Well, the thing I want you to observe is, is that, first of all, is that zero and plus, okay, in terminology that perhaps Frank will discuss, are what I would call positive types, or they're examples of what you could call inductive types. <coughs> they're both inductive types. Zero and plus are inductive types. Well, what does it mean to be an inductive type? Well, basically, uh, the way to say it is it has a mapping out property. Okay? That the way in which I characterize an inductive type is by how it behaves that by giving you this mapping out property of case analysis or abort. What does it mean to map out of that type? Why should it be expressed as a mapping out property? Because the characteristic feature of an inductive type is that I want to say certain things are in it and nothing else. The extreme bold clause is the most important part of the thing, okay? It's well and good to say a type contains their own successor, but it's very important to say and it doesn't contain anything else, otherwise it's not the natural numbers. So if it contains bottom, it's not the natural numbers and I don't care what anyone calls it. Okay? That's just false. All right? I want it to be nothing else. Okay? So, in particular, in lazy languages, there are no inductive types. There are things that are called map, that are called list, that are called tree. They are not trees, they are not lists, they are not natural numbers. Because they don't enjoy this mapping out property. Okay? So, beware of marketing. Okay, so, <laughs> general rule. Okay? So, just because something is called something doesn't mean it is that. Okay, so the point is that the case analysis is witnessing that there's nothing else but it left in the inner right. 
by virtue of the fact that I postulate that a mapping exists out of A plus B, knowing only what to do on, on, on an, essentially an inlet, what to do on an A, and what to do on a B. Okay? And if, that, if I know only that, then I know everything I need to know. That's what expresses the minimality. The abort expresses the fact that there's nothing in the empty type. It's the least type containing dirt. Okay? End of sentence. Okay? So it's the least type of all. Okay? And so the first be the least type of all means that if I have a mapping out property. Okay? So this, this could have been written if you want to make it look more like a mapping out property. I could have said from z in 0, a word in z is in c. It's a mapping out property. Okay. Co-inductive things, or negative types, have a mapping in property. Okay. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about, I think I want to talk about this property. I have too many touch the property. Okay. But let's talk about this guy. Okay, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to say that uh, it's the natural number. So this part is not supposed to be interesting. What's interesting is the way I discuss the equality and stuff. So we'll explain that the universal properties that characterize the natural number. So oh, this will be plot uh, back nat introduction. I could do nat formation, but it's a little dull. Okay, so we'll do that. And then uh, I can phrase this in different ways, but if x is in nat, we've done successor of that. Is in, uh, is in nat. Okay, so that's also a nat introduction. Both of these are, I can do it like this. Both of these guys are nat introduction. Okay, and now the question is, so, okay, that contains those two things. Now I want to say it's the least thing that contains it. So when Ed talks about universal properties, he's going to give you a mapping out property. He's going to tell you about the existence of certain maps is what characterizes it as being initial. And it, what I'm going to do is I'm explaining that something is an initial algebra for a certain function. We'll explain that in a second. Okay, so, uh, so right now, so how do I e explain that it's the least touch? Well, the way I explain it's the least type is I'm going to tell you under what condition, what suffices for giving a map out of net. I want to give a map out of net. I'm going to, obviously, I'm going to fill something in. Okay. So I'm going to claim, in order to express that it's the least thing, I'm going to claim there's a unique map. That's where the equations will come in, and that's where we're going to get into trouble. But I'm going to claim that there's a unique map determined by certain data. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. So what is that data? The data is, well, let's think about it by the inversion principle. What could that poss this x possibly be? Well, it could be 0, or it could be the successor of something else. Okay? Because that's all I put in. So I want to express that everything I put in is all that matters, so that's why I express it as a mapping out factor. Okay, so that means if you give me m, which is in, well, uh, yes, which is, uh, uh, give me one second, yeah, M is in C. This will get more complicated momentarily, but right now it's very simple as possible case. So if you give me an element of C, and given an element of C, if you give me another element of C, then I claim that that's enough, we'll call this the, uh, you know, iterator, okay, for NAT, which says from M, X dot C. I didn't really need to call that X. So, that's, so I want to call that one a Z because that's been my pattern. So let's let's stick with the pattern because it will help. It doesn't really matter, but that's just X dot N. Okay, written like that. So I claim if you give me what to do on the on zero, and you give me what to do on, and I'm going to explain why that reading is correct in a second. And if you tell me what to do given what I already did, then that's enough to give me a map out of map. Okay? So how do I explain, how do I justify that terminology? Well, if you say, iter, let me just write it, m x dot n on zero is going to be m in the appropriate type. And you say, if iter of successor of n, oh, don't call it that, pardon me, m prime x dot n, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting myself out of myself, pardon me. 
uh, and I put successor of something here, m prime. And what should that be? Probably some of you know. It should be do whatever you did uh, on m prime. Plug that in for x and do n one more time. Okay, that's the idea. So, as an example, if you haven't seen this kind of thing before, uh, I can uh, add two to a number. Okay, I just made that up off the top of my head. How do I add two to zero? Well, I make, I make two. And if I've already added two to x, how do I add two to the successor of x? Well, I just add two to the successor of x. So what I do is I take this guy and I make two more. And if I'm not mistaken, that should be right. Of course, there are other ways to write this program, but uh, I, I just, I literally just made that up off the top of my head, so I hope I did it right. So the point is that this is the result of the recursive call. Did I do it right? No. Oh, okay. You don't want too successor right now. One more successor? No, because I've already had two right now. I've already had two at the bottom. So thank you, yeah. Well, you know, okay. Uh, uh, all right, so that's uh, that's what I'm doing. Here. So the point is to think of this as the result of the recursive call. From a programming point of view, like when I teach my freshmen from elementary programming point of view, the lesson that I always like to stress here is that to think, don't think in terms of like going around and around and around a lot of times. Okay, just think of the incremental effect. Okay, of each iteration, and let the recursion take care of itself. Okay, that's the what is happening here. So the incremental effect is just to take the successor, and at the bottom I have two, and then, then I've got that plus two. Okay, so that's the that's the, the beta-like rules. Okay, it's a very simple kind of thing. So I, it's worth my while if I call this thing, uh, you know, f. It's worth my while uh, to to say here is a fact. Okay, it's very worth my while to say this at the moment. Here's the best thing I can say, the spec that I can give to this guy. I want to give a spec, and here's the best thing I can say right now. I can say for all m in the actual natural numbers, honest to God, in my the math in which I'm doing this theorem, okay, in my Indian math, I claim that if you take iter, well, let's call that thing f, or let's call it, uh, I don't know, p2, which means that thing. Okay, I don't want to write it up. I claim that p2, when run on the numeral for m, is, well, there's different things I could say, but one of the things I could say is it's two more than the numeral m, which is, of course, the numeral for m plus two. Very important that you notice what I'm saying here because it informs what comes next, okay? The best I can say about the correctness criterion of this astonishingly sophisticated program is that if you run it on a concrete number, okay, m, that is a numeral, a successor, blah, 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 okay, 10 times, then what I'm going to get back is this concrete numeral. And in the fact that I've developed so far, there's no other, there's nothing else, I, I think there's nothing else I can say, nothing stronger I can say. This is a precise characterization of what this, what this is doing. It's characterizing this function extensionally, okay? So this is an extensional characterization. So what we're going to see in a little while, okay, is that despite appearances and uh, uh, things you might naturally assume without thinking too hard, you're going to find out that this issue is utterly broken in, uh, in uh, 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 Markov's type theory of the uh, basic form that I'm going to explain. Okay? This issue of extensionality is very fundamental. There's something that's written as an arrow that is by no means an arrow. Okay? I'm going to show you that. It's a major problem. Okay, so we'll get to it. But the point is, it's extensional. What does that mean? It's that I'm talking about its I.O. behavior. I'm saying, oh, you know, here's a piece of code that exhibits the behavior that it maps m to m plus 2. You see, the fact that its graph consists of ordered pairs of the form m m plus 2 is an extensional summary of what it does. But it doesn't tell you how it does it. Okay? This is telling you how it does it. And then I'm stating that this is, in particular, a function with that property. 
Okay? So that's the notion of extensionality. So it's going to come up next when I talk about our data. Because the question is, what should be the uniqueness principle or the iterator? So let's write it like this. So based on the discussion I gave you so far, I want to be able to have an equation that says, uh, if you give me some random R that satisfies certain properties, I'm going to claim that R has to be the recursive, uh, which I wrote our iterator. Uh, yeah, I'm calling this the iterator. Okay. Iterator from uh, M, X dot M, uh, and applied to Z, okay, and C. Okay, so what I'm shooting for is a uniqueness property. I'm saying that under some conditions, if R, you know, behaves like an iterator, then it is the iterator. And now comes the problem. How do I state that R behaves like an iterator? And now I'll show you a little secret of type theory that turns out to matter a lot. Okay? I was able, why was I able to say in this somewhat cluttered line down here at the bottom, I was able to say that R is the case analysis if it behaves like the case analysis. Well, why was I sort of able to, what, what is this R, R behaves like case analysis thing? Well, I was taking advantage of the finitary nature of the sum type. So what I was saying is, if R is extensionally like a case, then R is the case in the sense of being extensionally like it. Okay, see that's the idea. If, for all possible inputs, in left and in right, okay, it behaves like the case does, which is like that because of the beta rule written here. If I could have written here case blah 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 of in left of t and case blah 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 of in right of t. That's the same because I just simplified them, you see, when I wrote like that. So if it behaves like the case, then it is the case. It's a principle of extensionality. When you have only finite types, like the sum, that's easy to write down. I don't have one other premise of the rule, I'm done. What the hell am I going to do with the natural numbers? Okay? It's a nasty problem. Because the only thing I can do here is write something that is totally illegal, it's not an inference rule at all. But I'll just write it down. Okay? So what I will say is, if for every um, in the honest to God natural numbers of my ambient mathematics, if it's the case that for all those numbers, R, uh, if I plug in, let's go like that, N through Z, R, if that is, you know, inner blah, blah, blah of N at type C, then this will be the case. But you see, this is an infinitary rule. As some of you might have come across, it's an infinitary rule. You might have come across something in logic called the omega rule. Okay, in first order logic, or the logic called L omega 1 omega, no? Okay, it's a logic in which you have infinite uh, conjunctions. Okay, I'm allowed to say, what this means is, if R of 0 is iter of 0, and R of 1 is iter of 1, and R of 2 is iter of 2, and R of 3 is iter of 3, and R of 4 is iter of 4, and so on to the crack of doom, if all of those premises hold, then this equation holds. That's what the uniqueness is saying. So we have a problem, okay? Which is the methodology of local soundness and completeness, it doesn't work, okay? So you could say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, how would I prove this if I write this premise as a mathematical theorem? It would mean I need an inductive proof that goes up here, right? The way you prove something about all honest to God natural numbers is a proof by induction, by mathematical induction. So you might say, let's put a proof of by mathematical induction up here, and then bring that down below and use that. But now we run into a, more, another fundamental difficulty with the problem, which is the distinction between analytic and synthetic judgments. So the thing that I want to claim is that as defined like that, we want to distinguish this thing is a, what is called an, uh, an analytic judgment, which is a way of saying that it's self-evident 
Why do I mean it self-evident? It means it requires no evidence. No proof or no evidence. Okay, that's what I want to say here, because there's no room for any evidence. The judgment is M is equivalent to M in some sense that I'm trying to develop with you. Okay? What I'm trying to do is invent type theory with you. That's my point. I'm, rather than dish out the rules and tell you to memorize them, I'm trying to show you how you invent it, okay, and why it's problematic and why it's not as clean and simple and all solved as you might think of it. It's not in any way. So I'll explain, explain that as we go along. Okay, so this uh, is an analytic judgment. There's no notion of evidence, okay? Whereas, if I treat this as something that needs to be proved by mathematical induction, it means I need evidence to justify this equation, which means that the judgment becomes synthetic. Synthetic judgment is one that requires evidence. So if I had a proof pi of this fact in my ambient mathematics, then you might say the evidence for this Somehow or other, I have to annotate it. I don't know where to do it. They have to like stick pi down here somehow, which is the proof that that fact is true. Okay, but now it is no longer a simple statement of fact, m is equal to n. It's now a statement that m is equal to n because of this. And the whole game has changed. Okay, everything is becoming completely different. It starts to fall apart. Already, the theory starts to fall apart even before I finish developing it, okay? So, at this moment, I haven't said anything definitive, but what I want to do is call attention to something that will be a very critical issue in understanding type theory, okay? Yep. Why uh, isn't there the same issue for the finite case of just uh, yes. in left and in right? Yes. Uh, so, finitely, I can... When I write finitely many premises on a rule, I'm doing a proof by induction. But it's a trivial one, because I just write down all, well, in most cases, all two cases, or all 10 cases. Okay? As soon as it's infinite, the information that goes into that is non-trivial. Okay? That's the idea. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so that question comes. Okay, so I'm intending to make you uncomfortable, okay? Because if you really want to understand what the hell is going on with type theory or with various theorem provers based on type theory, like New Pearl and like Kadaka and like Falk and a bunch of others, you have to understand these things. Okay? And then you will understand why certain things are complicated and messy and very unpleasant. You will see. Okay? So this is the underlying issue. So the first thing I want to do at this stage of the lecture is simply call it to attention that this very nice sounding methodology starts to not scale straight off the bat. As soon as I get to anything interesting, I get into trouble. Okay? And it only gets worse from here, that I can tell you. And so, all right, good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over. I was originally intending to do the general theory of inductive and co-inductive types, but I'm actually going to skip this. Okay? All right, so one can think of this as a special case of a more general idea. The exact same issues come up. Uh, so in this way, it's very illustrative. Uh, yeah, so it's just, this example is kind of illustrative. But one can think of this as an example of an inductive type, which I would write maybe u. It's the least type containing 1 plus t. Well, this is like the most austere notation possible. If I use the labeled sum, and I call that one 0, which can, carries no data, and I call that successor, which carries, so instead of insisting on in left and in right all the time, give them names, then it would look more plausible. Okay? So I can think of NAT as really just notation for the least type containing zero and closed under successor, closed under because it's T arrow T, that's what's going on here, and this is one arrow T. So another way of saying that is I have a functor, call it, uh, let's call it a uh, script down, okay? whose type is going to be 1 plus x arrow x, okay, that's the argument to the functor, okay, because what it's doing is it's saying uh, that uh, that is the same thing as having two maps, 1 arrow x, that's 0, okay, and uh, x arrow x, that's successor, 
And then what you do is you take what is called, you consider what is called the initial algebra. Okay, or n. That's the underlying story, okay, expressing categorical notation, and I'm not going to take any further than that. I'm just hoping that this will at least spark some feeling in you and you might want to pursue it uh, yourself. I have discussed all of this uh, in PSPL. If you want to look there, that's one possible source. It's all it's all there. Uh, so you can you can uh, have a look at that. So the general story is more of the same. Let me just leave it like that. Okay. Good. All right. So now I want to get into the next topic, which is intimately tied up with these issues of equality. So the message I want to make straight away is. Uh, you're used to, in any, anybody's mathematical experience, you just write down equations. And, and I hesitate to even say it this way, but there's two ways of saying it. Either an equation is true or it's not. Or the way I prefer to say it is, an equation is at most true. Mm -hmm. That's the right way to say it. Okay? Why is it the right way? Because I am an intuitionist and I don't accept that uh, every proposition is decidable. To me, that's an absurd thing. So I prefer to say, an equation is at most true. Okay, that's the idea. And what do I mean by that is you might be able to prove that it's true, but you don't care what the proof is. It's proof irrelevant. Okay? But what we're going to develop here is a notion of equality. What, is, what I'm beginning to hint at here is we need a notion of equality for which the proof is relevant. Okay? And that is the connection to homo sexual. Starts right there. Okay? All that is all about is just a proof relevant to the equality. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. Okay? All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm gearing you up for various things. Okay, so the next thing I need to talk about are families of types. And to be emphatic, I'll change my time here. But to be emphatic, I should say, really, Type indexed families of types. Let's make that much better. Type indexed families of types. Uh, quick question before you get too far ahead. Um, did we finish the issue with equality? Or is it like did, uh, did the business with the, uh, the initial algebra, did that finish up the issues with equality? No, the exact same equalities arise there. I say issues with equality arise there. So I'm going to let Matt suffice. If I were to develop the general theory of inductive types or co-inductive types, a completely analogous thing would uh, happen, except they're more confusing because of uh, a greater level of generality. So uh, I think I can make my points just by sticking with that. So that's what I'm going to do. So what I need to do is talk about families of types. And this uh, raises some technical issues uh, and so on. And there are various ways to, uh, to think about this. All right, so here's, here's what I will do, the way I will mention this. So, in terms of sets, you've seen this kind of thing before. You've seen the set of x sub i such that i is an i. That's a family of sets indexed by a set. Okay? The question becomes that you, you have to face in one form or another, one way or another, you have to ask what actually is a family of sets. Okay? Because in the setup of axiomatic set theory, there isn't a, a, you know, an axiom governing families of sets. So there's an ugly mess which I don't want to get into. Okay? But I kind of want to say, you can think of this two ways, which Ed, I think, alluded to this morning, which is in terms of the notion of a vibration, I think you mentioned. Did you mention that? No. You're going to. It's going to be Friday. Okay. But, well, but we didn't I can think of this as two ways. You sort of want to think of this as that x is some sort of a function from i into Okay, I put that in quotes because it doesn't actually make sense. Because you can't say it's a function in set theory from i into set because that's not a set. So you have a problem. Okay. So the usual way around this problem is, is you use the axiom of replacement, which is that the image of, of i under x must be a set by an axiom. You just postulate that the axiom of replacement. So that means in this gigantic universe of all possible sets, I have here a direct image of i, and that will form a set. Okay? 
So the way you do that is, is you can also think of this guy as a thing called a vibration. I can form a big disjoint union. Okay, I can write it like this. An I and I equals. I'll have what's called the display map from X of I. That's my, that's what X is. If you were to think of it as that, it's just X goes down to I. What it's doing is it's saying, for every element in this big amalgamated space, which is supposed to be this direct image, basically, I'm telling you what index does it sit over. Okay, that's the idea. So this uh, so little p takes an element of this big union and says, oh, the one you're talking about, it happens to be over, you know, i, little i, which is in capital i. So there's two different ways of doing things. So Ed will talk about this kind of thing. Uh, this is a very you know, loose and speaking to give you a flavor. This is called uh, a, a fibration. There's a, there's a, let's not go into it right now. It's all related to preserving equality. So uh, I'll get into that. Okay, so later on we'll have fancy sounding terminology like homotopy lifting property, which sounds totally intimidating. It just means that you have a family of types that it respects equality. Okay, that's it. All right, it's nothing else. Okay. Well, a little something else because the evidence matters. So it, it's a way of saying that, but in a way that takes account of the evidence. Okay, that's it. That's all there is to it. It's a very simple thing. So, but if I were to think of this as some sort of function, you would expect it to respect the quality. So that's the first thing. But equal indices should give me the same set, whatever that means. Okay, so we're going to face the same sort of problem in type theory, which is how to formalize what is the notion of a family of types. Okay, so that's an analogy. Now, before I actually go into how to do that, I'll, I'll show in a minute more, de more details of what we do. Let me look at the motivation. <coughs> well, one motivation is by a process type. Okay, well that's one motivation. It's process type. Because what is the idea? The idea is supposed to be that a type corresponds to a proposition. It's the type of its proofs. Okay? The elements of the type are proofs of the proposition, so it's supposed to be that correspondence. So now I would ask you, what is the analog of a predicate? <coughs> or more generally, a relation, but a relation is a predicate over a product so I'm not going to worry about that. So we'll just say predicate, and that includes relation. Okay, what is the analog of a predicate? Well, it's a family of types. It's a family. Why? Because you're familiar in like ordinary first order logic. You have the idea of there's they don't use this notation. You have the idea of the domain of a quantification. Which can be called a type or a sort. It can be called a sort, it can be called a type. Probably it can be called other things like that. And you have the idea that phi is a proposition over x that involves the variable x ranging over that. So for example, uh, in ordinary first order logic, you normally say for x, y being individuals, there's one, it's unisorted, there's one sort or one type of individuals, iota, you have that x equals y is a proposition. That's not the notation that's used, but one could certainly use that notation. No textbook, but I know it is about. But this is a, a way to think about it. So it's a, and if you want to be really finicky about it, that equals applied to the pair x, y. Okay, that's what, that's why I say relations are predicates. Okay, so that, that's what's happening there. All right, and then you can do multi-sorted logic. So I could let that be any type, and then I have a notion of equality at that type. Okay, that has to be specified. And then, so the point that I want to make is, is that first-order logic distinguishes, and this is this is a bad idea that unfortunately has like taken over in programming languages as well. It distinguishes. I'll put it in quotes data from, well, all right, proofs, which is it distinguishes propositions from type. Well, what I would call types, okay, uh, in the more general sense. 
So in other words, in the first hand you have data, and then you have the notion of a propositional function, that's the way of saying it, or a predicate ranging over, whose range of significance is a type of That's the one thing we take in modern type theory from the original type theory by Russell and Whitehead, is that a type is the range of significance of a propositional function. That's the thing we take. Okay? So when we talk about equality of natural numbers, natural numbers is the type of which we're talking about equality. It's the range of significance of that relation. Okay? It's fundamental. Okay, that's the way we work. Unfortunately, so what you have in that kind of a picture is you have data over here, and then over here or above it or however you'd like to draw it, you have statements or propositions which are about the data. They say things about the data. The data is over here, and the propositions are over here, and the propositions are said to be true of the data or not. That's your standard predicate calculus view. Unfortunately, that's also the standard machine model view of computation. The Turing machine or a RAM or any of those machine models. You have the data over here, you have a tape, or you have a memory or something. And then you have a program over here, and the program acts on the data. And never the twain shall meet. Okay? That's the those standard models of computation. Except for the most important model of computation, which is the lambda problem. And the lambda calculus did not and does not distinguish between this program and data. The whole distinction goes away. Okay? The same happens in type theory. So first order logic is like this. You have a notion of proposition. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up saying um, we're going to end up saying that then the analog of a predicate is if, it, if a predicate is a propositional function that is a mapping that, given over a particular type, gives me back a proposition, then this is going to be, well, I don't have a good word for it, so I'll tongue in cheek, we'll call this a typical function, okay? So it's going to be a function that maps a type into the class of all types, okay? So I'm going to have a judgment that will look like this. If x is in a, b is the type. So we started with B as a type, or proposition, whatever, okay, and we're going to generalize it to have, from that to X is in A and B is a type, okay? That is the idea. Okay. So this is our, going to be our representation of the family of types. Well, maybe it is, okay? It's actually not going to be that. Let me just uh, check my notes to make sure I've said what I need to say. Um, yeah, so it's not going to be that, but before I argue why it's not going to be that, I have to, I have to uh, say a few things. So here's where I'm heading. Oh, what time am I finishing up on my time? Okay, okay. so here's, here's where I'm heading. Where I'm heading is this, is I have to formulate the notion of what is a family of types. So in the first instance, I can think of it like this. But there's a central issue, which is related to exactly what I wrote here, is what are the comprehension principles for families of types? What families of types exist? And it's going to turn out that if we do things this way, it uh, creates a big mess, OK? A big technical mess. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce something analogous to this, which is going to be called a universe, OK? But a universe is going to be a type. Okay, so a universe will be a type of types. It will not be the type of all types. It will just be a type of types. That's the, uh, the idea. And then the reason I want to do that is because then I can use whatever principles I have for forming functions will be equally applicable to forming families. And that will be extremely important because this will allow us to do the following sort of thing. I will be able to say, in most programming languages you know, if something like this is ill type. So what type should it have? Well, there's a perfectly reasonable type it should have, which is if x, <coughs> then that, and now I'm assuming I have such a thing called strength. 
That's perfectly valid. But it requires a comprehension principle that says this is a family indexed by x, which is a boolean. So bool 2 is by definition 1 plus 1, unit plus unit. Okay? And if it's just a case analysis, look at all this. So that's a perfectly valid type for this expression, provided I have families that are such a family. Okay? So there's an issue of what are the comprehension principles for families. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is if a family is some kind of an assignment of a type to a value of another type, that assignment must respect equality in whatever sense we give to equality. Okay? And I've raised some issues to like try to make you uncomfortable because the life notion of equality we started out with doesn't scale. Okay? So that it will get me into the real depth and difficult and fascinating part about type theory and where all the trouble lies. Why lots of things, there's tons of effort going on right now around the world of people thinking about equality and type theory. It's the absolute cutting edge uh, subject of research. So uh, I'm trying to get you there. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. All right, so that's what I will do. And uh, I guess I'm going to have to pick that up next time because I spent time on my exercise. So I lost a little time here. I wanted to go a little bit further today, but that's okay. It's more important to understand. So uh, any questions? Okay, it'll take a little time to, to uh, settle in. Okay, I will uh, try to post a few exercises uh, on top of it to let you uh, play around if you're not familiar with some of the things I mentioned today. And then we can, uh, and then we can, uh, we'll pick up things from there. Okay, good. Oh, yes. Did you mention any reading materials? Reading, yeah, uh, I, I can, yes, I can, I can get, I, I guess I will. I forgot to do that. 